it's Maggie Bot, and today I want to talk to you about A Feast for Odin. Uh, Feast for Odin is the new big title from Uwe Rosenberg, the same guy that did Caverna and Agricola and Bonanza and all the things, and if you've never heard of him, this is probably not the one to start on, but he's this fabulous designer out of Germany who likes to make games that have ton of different strategies and a lot of nuance and a lot of backstory um, with very everyman themes is what he calls them. So a lot of farming has been done before. I believe this might be his first uh, Viking game, but it's the everyday life of the Viking. It's not necessarily all warships and pillaging that is involved in the game, but it's also kind of their everyday life and celebrating their gods and doing other things that are important to them. Uh, the game is a one to four player game and I've played it at two and four. I would imagine that playing this at three plays very similarly to both of those player counts. I wouldn't worry about that and the solo game. I'm not going to play that for you, but I'm guessing it's just fine. That's what he does. He makes great little solo games. Um, this game is a table hog though, so on my little Ikea table without the wings put out, um, it pretty much takes over the whole thing, but you have a lot of chits, you have the excess boards, you've got player boards, you've got a few decks of cards, a lot of other bits, and then you have the main board where you do your worker placement. Um, the quality of the chits and wood and everything else in the game is highest quality. I wouldn't think you'd need to sleeve anything. It's just gonna, it's gonna be a really quality product and it's very expensive and it's very large. So it's a heavy old game. It's probably a hundred bucks, uh, but it's pretty fabulous anyway. And it'll probably stay on my shelves for a long time coming. I could see teaching this down the line and just, it's one of those just fun smorgasbord games and it's really fun to teach. Um, so that's something. Um, next, I'll just kind of go through uh, some of the good and the bad as it occurred to me. Um, the first thing that always matters to me are uh, the rules. Uh, how easy is it to explain? How hard is it to reference? And so the first thing I'll say is that the rule book is an okay rule book to learn out of, but it's a really hard one to reference. So even if you're looking for a specific, like, Everything is specific by phase and by action number, um, but a lot of things apply in two different places, and so they just kept writing, you know, refer back to page three, refer to page 14, and I feel like I was just playing some weird game with them chasing down the rules I was looking for, and not all of them seem to be in the book easily found. Um, there are a lot of spaces and unfortunately, if you saw um, on the player board, uh, you're going to give people, they're going to get very distracted with how do I fill up this player board, and they're not going to be able to listen to all of the things about the worker placement spots, but those are the, kind of the meat of the game. That's how you accomplish everything. So you really need to call stuff out by color, go through each action, and be really specific as much as possible, because each chunk of color has a very similar way of working. It should also be noted that this is one of those games where you can spend one worker to do a weaker action and possibly two, three, or four workers to do a stronger one. And when you spend three or four workers, you also get some card play going. Um, really fun to have asymmetrical numbers of turns. So if I take really big swingy actions, I'm going to get fewer turns than someone who takes teeny tiny um, actions and wants to just spend one meeple at a time. Um, the flow of the game itself is kind of interesting. It's um, either six or seven rounds. Each round you might get some stuff, but at the end of the round you have to feed your people. It's just kind of part of the game. And so seeing how you're going to get enough stuff to fill up this giant player board by the end of the game is a little bit difficult. Um, time and time again, you get to about round five or so, and it still looks like you're struggling to fill this board. But by the end of round seven, you have more pieces than you would need to fill your main board. So there's all these other like supplementary boards that you can buy to kind of help with that. But it's hard to see that coming. If you've not played it before, it's hard to trust that you will have enough time and enough stuff to fill that main board. Um, you also have that feast every round. And so remembering all of the rules that go with that can be a little bit distracting too. Um, so each piece in the game, you have uh, red and orange and you have blue and green. 
The red and orange ones are used primarily for the feast, and you can set them down, and each round you're going to get another meeple off that board, so you're going to have to feed more and more things. But you can't use, like, two of the same fish unless one is vertical and one is horizontal, and you're trying to just fill this empty spaces. It's an interesting mechanism, but it's easy for people to forget all of the things that go with it, because it's done toward the end of the round after you've explained all of the other things with worker placement. Um... Then you have um, kind of the less awesome bits in the game, and I would say one of the main ones that I've seen are the cards. So um, there are three decks of cards. One is weapons, which I have no issues with. One is kind of less handy, and one is more handy, but it's a deck of cards, and that's fine. You have a beginning of the game starter occupation, and it's this huge deck, and each person gets one, and the rest aren't used in the game. So... If you played this game a hundred times, you might not ever see the same occupation twice. Um, and I find that to be a little bit more unfortunate. I know people say that that adds replayability, but I like kind of a known environment a little bit better than some wacky thing that may or may not be helpful. And that takes me to the last part, is that this giant stack of cards that you get in this game, I'd say seven-eighths of them are trash and just not very playable, hard to use, situational. And so you spend quite a bit of the game feeling like if I lucked into the right card right now or I lucked into the right card at the beginning to build an engine out of, I'd be a lot better off than just drawing these awful cards that give me almost nothing. So it's another one of those games where I might prefer a an edited deck list if someone came out and said, you know, if you remove a third of the cards and these names of them, the cards suddenly get a little more consistent or a little better or a little worse, just so I know not to focus on them. Because I've seen them make or break a strategy in the game, and I don't I don't want to have to hope. <laughs> I'd rather know whether or not I'm going to get a good card. And the other um, sort of negative I have about the game is that there is animal breeding, just like a lot of Uve's games. Um, you can breed uh, cows and sheep, and they will reproduce, all that, albeit slowly. Um, but in the game, you can't really base a strategy around that. I've found that to be too weak of a strategy. It won't give you enough stuff. It gives you stuff, and with the right card or two, you really feel like you might have put an engine together, but it will never get you enough of what you need. Now let's talk about what's good. <laughs> and I apologize if we got a little glare on these photos. Uh, these are my test shots because my real shots apparently did not save. <laughs> um, I really love leveling stuff up. So each board that you have, including your main player board, has kind of a list of restrictions. So your main player board you can use green, blue, stone, and money, and green cannot touch each other in any way. Like no um, touching at all. Now, on this long house, uh, you can use green, blue, red, and orange, and the green and blue can touch. You can also use money on this board. Um, money is straight up victory points at the end of, uh, of the end at the end of the game. So if you don't need it to use to cover up any negatives, um, it's lots of points toward the end, and you also get points for that income with those little hands that go up the side. Um, you get some points written on all the boards that you take, but there's always going to be like negatives in case you didn't fill them properly. Each time you surround these little bonus areas, you're also going to get stuff at the end of every round, so it's good to get those filled up early. Um, I really love that um, you build those pieces up. So if I started with a green fish, I could upgrade it into a blue something, and blue is a little more versatile. Um, I really, really enjoy having that as a mechanism. I also find that the puzzle itself of how to fill the board and when is really intriguing. Um, I've had a lot of fun going income only and seeing if I can just fill up the outside spaces toward the end. I've had a little bit of fun buying some extra boards and just praying and hoping and have enough stuff. Um, there are these ships that you can immigrate out of the territory and that helps your feasts uh, cost less and they're also worth a lot of points so I've gone heavy immigration. Um, you get a lot of meeples in this game so there's just so many options. Uh, I've been having a lot of fun uh, exploring those and so I think overall if people are willing to just have a very, I'd say, low-stress um, game that doesn't ever feel overly full. Like, there are a lot of action spots in the game, and so it doesn't ever feel like 
when you go to place your meeple, everything you want will have been taken. A lot of the times, maybe one person is working on the same strategy as you, so maybe they took the same one, but it's never that dire, and it never feels overly full, even at four players. And the only difference between a three and a four player board is you get these little copy spaces at the bottom of the worker placement spots um, that allows you to copy one thing in the column above it. Um, which is an interesting twist as well. It's something that you're familiar with uh, from maybe Agricola. Um, overall, I really love Feast for Odin. I can't wait to play it some more. I really think it has a lot of different strategies and some fun. has a little bit of dice rolls, but they're mitigated and I've only really been screwed over twice by them. Uh, overall, a really very decent Uwe Rosenberg game. I would be very interested if someone wants to help me edit the deck down. Just take out some of these cards that are a little too situational, a little too one-off, and deliver a little more of a consistent product. Um, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below. Uh, I am Maggie Bot. You can also follow me over on the Meeples Included channel. The Meeples Included is a website and community dedicated to diversity and inclusivity. We have a really fun Twitch stream every other Friday, twitch.tv slash Meeples Included, and that's called Games on the Rocks. And also, this channel is brought to you by Patreon. I use my Patreon dollars to purchase games, equipment, and software upgrades, like this new Camtasia software that I'm using. Um, it's been super helpful in encouraging and a really cool way of delivering all of the projects I'm working on in one spot. So that's patreon.com slash MaggieBot. Anything else, please leave in the comments before below, and I will see you next time.